As Pastor Ones said, my name is Jono, and I have the privilege of opening up God's Word and kicking off our new series today. It's titled, Eating with Jesus. Now we know why you were salivating over those spatlo. And we landed on this series because, as you may recall from about two weeks ago, Pastor Ones said that Jesus is the perfect king who, over the course of his earthly ministry, sat and dined at various tables. Jesus sat and dined at various tables. And then Pastor Ono went on to mention many, many texts where we see this, right? Many of these eating with Jesus accounts are recorded in the Gospel of Luke. In fact, an author by the name of Robert Karras even wrote a book titled, Eating Your Way Through Luke's Gospel. And in the book, Karis makes the case that in the gospel, according to Luke, Jesus is either enjoying a meal, he's making his way to a meal, or he's coming from a meal. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, man, another reason to love and follow Jesus. Amen? (laughs) Family and friends, we saw this two weeks ago. We're going to see this again today and throughout this upcoming Eating with Jesus series. The table matters. The table matters. And it's not just in the Gospel of Luke that we see the significance of the dinner table, okay? Right from the beginning, in Genesis 2, God sets the table before Adam and Eve, and he tells them what they can and cannot eat. Just one chapter later, we see the fall, when Adam and Eve sin by eating the forbidden fruit. The table matters. The table matters. We see this throughout the Old Testament, in the nation of Israel. We saw this two weeks ago. Pastor One preached on 2 Samuel 9, where King David invites Jonathan's son, Mephibosheth, to the royal table. And as I've already mentioned, we see this with Jesus regularly in the Gospels, sitting around the table. We then see his followers in the book of Acts, sitting around the table, tabling with others. We read the apostles' letters to the New Testament church, addressing issues around the table. And finally, we read of the heavenly marriage banquet that Christians will get to partake in in Revelation 19. The table matters. Amen? Yeah. In fact, it matters so much that we're going to devote an entire series to it up front near the beginning of the year in light of the hashtag more season that we believe God is calling us to as a local family of believers. And as we are asking our Lord Jesus, Lord, What would you have us as a church learn from you and who you tabled with? Who, O Lord, are you calling us to eat with? But before we dive into the who, before we dive into who is the Lord Jesus calling you to eat and table with, let's remind ourselves of what we find at that beautiful table with Jesus. We just sang about it earlier. At the Lord Jesus' table, we find an open invitation. Come and eat, taste and see that the Lord is good. We find fellowship. We find union. We find communion, intimacy with God. We find identity and restoration. Family, we find abundance and life and joy. And so this morning, it is our prayer that you would come to this table with open heads, hearts, and hands as we come to our text for today. Luke 5, verses 27 to 39. I'm going to be reading from the Christian Standard Bible from Luke 5, verses 27 to 39. If you brought your Bibles, meet us there, or your devices. It will also be up on the screen, Luke 5, verses 27 to 39. This is the word of our Lord. Let's read together. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, Follow me. So leaving everything behind, he got up and began to follow him. Then Levi hosted a grand banquet for him at his house. Now there was a large crowd of tax collectors and others who were reclining at the table with them. But the Pharisees and their scribes were complaining to his disciples, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus replied to them, it is not those who are healthy who need a doctor, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, 
but sinners to repentance. Then they said to him, John's disciples fast often and say prayers, and those of the Pharisees do the same, but yours eat and drink. Jesus said to them, you can't make the wedding guests fast while the groom is with them, can you? But the time will come when the groom will be taken away from them. Then they will fast in those days. He also told them a parable. He says, no one tears a patch from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. Otherwise, not only will he tear the new, but, he, but, he, but also the piece from the new garment will not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wine skins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins. It'll spill and the skins will be ruined. No, new wine is put into fresh wine skins. And no one after drinking old wine once knew because he says the old is better. Let us pray. Father God, we come before you today recognizing, Lord God, that you are so gracious to invite us to this table. We thank you that you, in your wisdom, sent Jesus to make a way for us to know you, to commune with you, to eat with you, to celebrate with you, to experience joy, abundance, and life. What a gracious, good, merciful God you are. And we come before you now as your people here at Ruta Fellowship in Pretoria this morning, acknowledging, Lord God, that this is all because of you. This is all for you. I pray, Lord God, this morning that this message would serve as an appetizer to the series. Lord God, would this be a time that you draw us nearer to you, Lord God, that you fill us and nourish us. And at the same time as an appetizer, Lord God, you, you keep us wanting more, more of you, more of your goodness, more of your grace, more of your presence in our life. And so Holy Spirit, come now. Lead me as I preach your word. Lead our thoughts, our minds. Lead our hearts, lead our hands as we respond to you, Lord God. Would this be all to your honor and glory. Would many come to know you and know you more in this time. We pray this in Jesus' mighty and holy name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. So family, this morning, we just read from the Gospel of Luke, which is one of the earliest written accounts of Jesus' life. And it's the first of two volumes, okay? It's the first of two volumes written by Luke, found in the Bible, in what we call the New Testament. So in other words, the books written after the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Luke wrote the book of Luke, which is volume one, and then he wrote the book of Acts, volume two. It's understood that Luke becomes a follower of Jesus because of spending time with the Apostle Paul, the same Apostle Paul who wrote nearly half of the New Testament and planted many of the first churches. And so Luke comes to faith in Jesus after experiencing transforming grace of the gospel, and he trades his day job to be the traveling companion and co-worker of the Apostle Paul. Before joining Paul on his evangelistic missions and before he began to write the gospel of Luke in the book of Acts, Luke was a doctor or a physician. And so I think it's fair to say that Luke was quite detail oriented and precise. But as with many doctors, I cannot comment on his handwriting. Couldn't have been that bad though. I mean, we do have his, his writings 2,000 years later. So perhaps that was the Holy Spirit. And so after coming to faith in Jesus and after experiencing the transformative grace of the gospel, Luke writes this gospel of Luke because he knew firsthand that the story of Jesus was not just ancient history of some kind of special teacher, but it was an actual fact, the fulfillment of the long-awaited promises between God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the nation of Israel, and eventually the whole world. And so I'd encourage you, family, to go read the gospel of Luke for yourself. You'll see that in chapters 1 and 2, there's this long, detailed introduction that sets up the story of Jesus and his cousin, John the Baptist. And then in chapters 3 through 9, where we're going to be spending a fair amount of time in this series, Luke goes into a lot of detail as he writes down and records Jesus' mission as Jesus moved through his home region of Galilee. And as you read these chapters, you'll see that Luke emphasizes that Jesus is undoubtedly undoubtedly the long-awaited, prophesied, true king of Israel who is on a mission. He is on a mission to usher in the kingdom of God, not only to the nation of Israel, 
but instead extending it to all humanity who would put their faith and trust in Jesus. Importantly for us this morning, before we dive deeper and tuck into chapter 5, let's, let's go back a little bit and visit chapter 4 as Luke highlights the social implications of Jesus' mission. I just want to go back to chapter 4 as Luke highlights the social implications of Jesus' mission. It'll come up on the screen. Luke 4, verses 18 to 19. Jesus goes into the synagogue in his hometown of Nazareth. He gets up and he says these words. It says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, family, in these verses, Jesus is quoting the Old Testament prophet Isaiah, right? He's quoting from Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 and 2, word for word. And in so doing, he is saying that he is the one who was prophesied about hundreds of years before. He is the long-awaited son of God. And in these verses, when Jesus speaks of freedom... The Greek word that Luke uses is aphesis, aphesis, which means to liberate, liberation. In fact, the liberation and freedom that Jesus is speaking of is the same kind of liberation and freedom that is spoken about in the Old Testament book of Leviticus 25, when the nation of Israel was to practice the year of Jubilee, a time every 50 years when all debts were canceled. Jesus has come to cancel all debts, to liberate, to set us free. But for who exactly has Jesus come to set all debts free? Well, if we look at the same text, Luke chapter 4, verse 18 and 19, Jesus says the Spirit of the Lord has appointed him to preach good news to the poor. To the poor. And here, when Jesus says the word poor, he makes use of the Hebrew word for poor, which is ani, ani. And these people, the ani, were not just those without money. It was a much broader category. Now, you might be wondering, man, I never have cash on me. I've only got Apple Pay. (laughs) That's probably not why you're poor and poor. But you may be poor. We'll get into that. You may be poor. The poor that Jesus is referring to is a much broader category. It was those not just without wealth. It was people of low social status. The vulnerable. Those with disabilities. Widows. Children. The elderly. And family, I want you to to get this. Of great significance for us today was that the Ani also referred to people who were considered the outcasts of society, the lowest of the low, those who the Jews were discouraged from associating with. And so here in these verses, in Luke 4, 18 to 19, Jesus says that he is specifically going to set these ani, the poor, the vulnerable, the oppressed, and those whose circumstances had ostracized them. He's come to set them free from all debts. Luke writes that the arrival of God's kingdom through Jesus Christ is especially good news for the ani, the poor. And then in the following chapters, we are shown account after account, story after story of what Jesus' kingdom, the good news and the gospel looked like specifically for these ani. At the beginning of Luke chapter 5, we see how Jesus heals an ani, a physically vulnerable, paralyzed man. And he does it because of this man and his friend's faith. But this was much to the disdain of the religious teachers known as the Pharisees and scribes. You see, they were all about the strict traditional Jewish law. They were obsessed with the legalistic following of the Jewish law above all else. They believed in a salvation by works. They believed that you were good with God based on what you did and didn't do based on where you went and didn't go, based on who you associated with and who you distanced yourself from, and on doing the appropriate things at the appropriate times. 
And on being so focused on these things, they would miss the heart of the matter. Because all of this, because of all of that, they did not recognize Jesus as the promised son of God, standing before them, healing the poor. In fact, they were even angry at Jesus because as he healed this man, he essentially said to him, Ani, your sins are forgiven. You are free. Poor man, you are poor no more. And oh, how the Pharisees didn't like that. Because only God can forgive sins. But they had missed it. They had missed it. And they had clearly missed Jesus, the promised son of God, standing right in front of them. But they couldn't see him clearly because of their hardened hearts and because of their fixation on their self-righteous law. And so that's all of what was going on before we come to our table today. That's the context for our table today. And as we tuck into our text this morning, I'd ask us to have these questions in the back of our minds. As we dive deeper into chapter 5, verses 27 to 39, let's have these questions in the back of our minds. How does Jesus use the meal or the table to expand the circle of those invited and to discover the healing power of God's kingdom as he brings good news to the poor? How does he use the table to reverse and restore the unease, the poor, and indeed our whole life circumstances? And what does this mean for us as followers of Jesus Christ? And if you're here today and you're not a believer in Jesus, but you're curious about who he is, what do you do with this dinner invitation? What does it mean for you? Let's dive deeper. Luke chapter 5, verse 27. I'm going to reread it. It says, after this, after what? We should be asking, after what? Remember, Jesus has just healed a whole bunch of sick people, including a paralyzed man whose friend's faith in Jesus caused them to lower him through the roof of a packed building, which leads to Jesus then confronting the Pharisees. So after that, after that account, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax office. Some other translations say tax booth which essentially means that this guy, Levi, the tax collector, was, this, was sitting at a table along the area of the Sea of Galilee, all right, which was strategically placed as a trade route between Syria and Egypt. So he's sitting at this table, Sea of Galilee, and he's there for a reason. And he, being Jesus, said to, to Levi, follow me. Verse 28, so leaving everything behind, laying it all down, Levi got up and followed him. Now, any detail, any detail that a gospel writer, and here in this situation Luke includes, is significant, okay? So he includes the fact that this man's name is Levi. And so he was named after the priestly tribe of Israel, and so this man must be Jewish. He's an Israelite, okay? But then we hear that he is a tax collector. Now, the nation of Israel at this time is under a, Rome, under a Roman rule, and so any taxes being paid are not going to the nation of Israel, but instead they are being funneled towards Caesar and Rome. The Jews had another name for these tax collectors who made money at the expense of their own people. They called them collaborators. Collaborators. And this word at the time was used synonymously with the word sinner. One who disobeys God. And so you could see that the Jews thought of this Jewish tax collector this collaborator. They viewed them as sinners and intentionally excluded them. And you could understand why. Honestly, fam, we can understand why. Scholars say that the nation of Israel under Roman rule was one of the most taxed nations ever. There were taxes on absolutely everything. And so what these tax collectors would do is that they would go to the Roman authorities and determine what tax was imposed on the people. And then they would go to the people and impose an even higher tax and they'd pocket the profit. And so, Levi was most likely an exploitative, wealthy man. Not physically poor. He was an exploitative, wealthy man. But he would have been an ani. Because of his life's decisions, because of his trade, and because of this, he would have had an extremely low social status. The best comparison or best analogy I could come up with is imagine an ESCOM exec who's just announced an 18% hike increase. 
how popular we, would we feel that person is? But if you're here and you're from ESCOM, we love you. The table, <laughs> the table is, is, is big and there's enough space for you. Or perhaps you work for a fly-by-night uh, <laughs> college and you know and you're taking registrations. No, just... And so when Jesus said back in Luke 4 that he has come to set the poor free, family, he was talking about the Levi's of this world. The tax collectors, the exploiters, the sinners, and the thieves. Oh, how Jesus knew we all needed a savior. Amen? The text also tells us that Levi was a tax collector at the Sea of Galilee, okay? Along the trade route between Syria and Egypt. And the nation of Israel were taxed on most things, as I mentioned. But there would have been a fishing tax. There would have been a fishing tax. And so I'm sure you can imagine what Jesus' other disciples, the Jewish fishermen on the Lake of Galilee, thought of this man named Levi. And I can only imagine that Levi must have recognized these men and knew that there must have been hostility towards them. Jesus has just called them a few verses earlier, and now he's calling Levi. And yet, what is his response? Immediately laid all down. I would have been like, man, I know those guys. I know they don't like me. Should I go? Shouldn't I go? Levi lays, lays it all down, immediately goes. Levi's response is immediate. And I think it's for two reasons that he immediately follows Jesus. The first one being is that Jesus is the son of God. He is the son of God. And he's just called this man. And so in a flash, Levi recognizes that. The second reason, though, is that I think Levi knew he was poor. Levi knew that he was poor. He knew he was an ani. Every day he would have been hated, despised, ridiculed, and mocked. Every day. Every day, Levi knew his social property. And because he knew it, he trades it in for a new purpose. Immediately, sign me up. Contrast this fam with the rich young ruler, Mark 10, Luke 18. Here comes a man to Jesus, and he asks Jesus what he needs to have eternal life. Jesus says, follow all the laws. He says, no, I've, I've, I've followed all the law. He says, okay, sell all your possessions and follow me. This man couldn't do it. Why couldn't he do it? I don't think it was because he was rich. Levi was also rich. But because unlike Levi, this rich young ruler didn't know that he was poor. He didn't know that he was an ani. He was in denial about his spiritual poverty. Then move on to verse 29. Verse 29. Then Levi hosted a grand banquet. Somebody say grand banquet. Grand banquet. Everybody, grand banquet. grand banquet. Then Levi hosted a grand banquet for Jesus at his house. Now there was a large crowd of tax collectors and others who were reclining with him at the table. In just two verses... We see the transforming power of Jesus. In two verses, we see that Levi has traded the table of the tax booth, and he's traded it for the table with the king. A table of royalty. And then, what does he do? What does he do? Well, this transformation is too good not to share. Just like any good food, that's too good not to share. And so he invites Jesus to his crib, which is no doubt pretty sick, with killer views, and he throws what we would call an epic rager, inviting all of his tax collector buds. Come on. And they come, and they eat with Jesus. In fact, Luke describes them as tabling and reclining. Jesus is not rushing for a 10-minute coffee with these people. He is savoring moment by moment with these tax collectors and sinners. And he is reclining with them. If you want to chill out in those chairs, go ahead. It's biblical, right? I'm sure this is what you guys are going to do at Spaces a bit later at Starbucks. Recline. There's no rush. There's relaxing. There's intimacy. But I don't want you to mishear me. Jesus is reclining and eating with tax collectors and sinners. And he may be eating with them, these physically rich folks, but spiritually poor, 
and he's chilling with them at the table. But hear me, fam, he's not participating in any sin. Jesus is not sinning. He cannot sin. He's the son of God. There is a difference. Jesus, the perfect son of God, fully God and yet fully man, was without sin. And because of this, he can die a death on a cross for all of those who would have sinned and pay the all-sufficient price, thus setting us free forever from sin, canceling all debts, setting the poor free. Friends and family, Jesus loves us all so much that he came to earth and made a way for us to know and love the Father, and he uses as many means as necessary to save sinners. He meets with people where they are, at the table, and he accomplishes that without ever sinning. But that doesn't mean he doesn't face opposition for associating so closely with sinners. Verse 30. But the Pharisees and their scribes were complaining to his disciples. Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Now remember, these were the self-righteous Pharisees who believed in being saved by works. They believed that you were unclean and sinning if you were merely associating with sinners and healing the unclean, as Jesus has done in the previous verses. And now here's Jesus sitting and reclining with them and eating with them at the table. Even the Pharisees recognize the significance of the table. And that takes it to a whole other unclean level. And so they asked Jesus and the disciples, which makes me wonder, makes me wonder. They asked Jesus and the disciples as Jesus is sitting around the table. They ask him this. They say, why is he sitting and eating and drinking with sinners? Now, for the Pharisees to be asking the disciples those questions at the party, perhaps they were invited which once again highlights Levi's desire to see more and more people come to faith. After he experienced his call and transformation, even those who vehemently opposed and looked down on him, or the other reason for the Pharisees to be asking this question to the disciples could have also been that they were out there looking for reasons to bash Jesus, looking and seeking out gossip to put others down and to argue with others. Now, either one of these situations or both could be true. However, I think the main takeaway here and for us is this, fellow brother, fellow sister in the Lord, be like Levi. Extend hospitality, love, and grace even to those who oppose you. They're in his house. They got in. And Levi didn't say, no, 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 you guys aren't invited. It's only for me and my friends. Be like Levi. Extend hospitality. Don't be like the Pharisees. Don't be out here on some mission seeking to see where others are sinning and falling short, going out at night and thinking, who can we catch tonight? Don't be showing up to church, family group, or serving in your ambassador department, longing to see others trip up, to stumble, fail, and fall. Don't be constantly seeking to divide and oppose where there is no sin. Don't be out on social media bashing fellow brothers and sisters in the faith for associating with sinners or for taking a view that you may not like or agree with, but it is a view that is not sinful. Quit seeking to divide the body of Christ. Be like Levi, don't be like the Pharisees. But hear me clearly, I'm not saying don't call out brothers and sisters sin in love. That's not what I'm saying. We are called to do this for the glory of God, the good of the one being called out, and the health of the church. But family, if we are just arguing over self-righteous preferences that puff ourselves up and put others down and cause division within the family of God, we seriously need to stop and repent of that. We need to stop and repent of that. Verse 31, Jesus replied to them, it is not those who are healthy who need a doctor, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. I love it that a doctor actually wrote these words, right? I can imagine Luke hearing and reading all the eyewitness accounts, retelling the story, and every time thinking, yep, amen, I'm a doctor. I help those who are sick. That's my job. I'm a doctor. I'm here for those who are sick. That's what I'm called to do. I mean, I know many of us have the privilege of preventative health care, which means some of us make use of the doctor when we are feeling great, but I'd venture a guess that most of the time we're seeing a doctor or we're consulting with them because we're unwell. The doctor is for the unwell. Uh, It's nearly five months ago that I had a back surgery. Thank you for your prayers. You guys have been uplifting me. But I remember at that time, 
Before the surgery, I was in the hospital room and you'd hear, it's like bustling outside and you'd hear those, those footsteps walking down the ward. And I was always excited to see visitors. I was thrilled to see nurses coming with some pain medication. But man, was I really, really anxious for the doctor to come and walk through those doors. Then I had the surgery and man, I was grateful to all those love, loving messages and people coming around and visiting me. But man, was I anxious to hear how the surgery went from my doctor. The doctor has come to heal the sick. In fact, we often hear tragic stories when people don't know that they are sick. And so they have not consulted a doctor. They see no need for this. And it's the same with these Pharisees. It is the same with the Pharisees. Jesus sarcastically refers to them as righteous. Because in reality, all have fallen short of the glory of God. And therefore, without Jesus, no one is righteous. And so when Jesus says that he has not come to call the righteous, he means these Pharisees who are, in fact, self-righteous and do not see themselves as spiritually sick, in desperate need of a savior. Jesus has come because we are all spiritually sick sinners in need of a savior. And he makes that crystal clear to all of those gathered around the table. Jesus has come to fulfill his purpose and to do his job. And one of the ways in which he does this is to meet with sinners around the table, to lead them to repentance, to turn away from sin and put their faith and trust in Jesus as their Lord and Savior and to call them to follow him. Verse 33. Then the Pharisees said to him, John's disciples fast often and say prayers. And those of the Pharisees, our followers, do the same. But you eat and drink. So the Pharisees couldn't catch Jesus out for eating with sinners. And so now they try and criticize him for eating and feasting. And for being joyful and enjoying life. And so what does Jesus do? Well, he debunks their question with a question of his own. Verse 34, Jesus said to them, You can't make the wedding guests fast while the groom is with them, can you? Jesus puts before these Pharisees a scenario. He says, imagine a wedding with no food. Now, what's cool is that Jesus is speaking from experience here, right? I mean, he was at a wedding in Cana in John chapter 2 where they ran out of wine. And he knew what that would do to that celebration. So much so that when, he's asked mom, when his mom asked him to help, he performed the first of his miracles, turning the water into wine. And now here he says, imagine you were at a wedding with no food. A wedding with no wine, some people don't drink wine. Some people drink wine. But at a wedding, everybody eats. And so imagine being at a wedding with no food. I have no doubt that if you want to wreck a party, invite folks to a wedding celebration, don't feed them. People will not stay very long to celebrate your new son-in-law. Guaranteed. Not eating at a wedding would have been strange in Jewish tradition. And so Jesus sarcastically asks the question, you can't make the wedding guests fast while the groom is with them, can you? Have you ever had a friend visit from out of town? Or perhaps you go back to your hometown and you're looking forward to catching up with these close loved ones and, you, and you're wanting to feast together. And then as you do, as you get there, you meet your friends and your family, hugs, we're so glad to see you. But then they say, oh, by the way, I, I'm on a diet. Man, I was hoping that we'd go to all our, our local hangouts and enjoy the cuisine. Family, feasting is for when you're celebrating each other's company. Dieting, fasting is for when you were apart from one another. Feasting is for when you are celebrating each other's company. And so here in this verse, on the one hand, Jesus is prophesying about himself as the coming bridegroom. We see this in Revelation 19, where the church is referred to as the bride of Christ and Jesus as the bridegroom. But to his immediate audience sitting around the table, he's ultimately saying that the time for joy and celebration with Jesus before his death is then and there, at that very moment. That was the time to be eating with Jesus, and so that's what his followers were appropriately doing. But then he says, verse 35, verse 35, he says, but a time will come a time will come when the groom will be taken away from them. They will fast in those days. 
On the one hand, Jesus recognizes fasting. Jesus recognizes fasting. Times when believers abstain from food or feasting during certain times or seasons. In fact, Jesus even teaches on fasting on the famous Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6. And so Jesus recognized fasting. But he's up to something more here. Jesus now begins to allude to the cross and his coming death. A time his immediate audience of followers around the table would need to face. And at the same time, Jesus is alluding to the time after his ascension into heaven as well. And this is the time that we, as present-day Christians, currently find ourselves in. We are in the now and the not yet. Christians today have victory over sin and eternal death, and so we can be joyful and feast. Amen? Amen. And at the same time, we are living in this broken, fallen world, awaiting on our bridegroom to return. And so we wrestle with pain and sorrow. But as we do this, we can fast and pray because Christian fasting is centered on Jesus in order to draw us closer to Jesus, to become more mindful of him, and even to become more reliant on him. And then, and so after these back and forths around the table at Levi's house, Jesus summarizes all that he has just said. It goes on the initiative. And then he really drives home the points on his earthly mission. And he does this by telling two terrible parables or stories, two parables that make the same point. He says, verse 36, told them this parable. No one tears a patch from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. Otherwise, not only will he tear the new, but also the piece from the new garment will not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins. It will spill, and the skins will be ruined. No new wine is put into fresh wineskins. What's Jesus doing here? Verse 36 to 38. Well, he's essentially saying to these self-righteous Pharisees who follow the Old Testament law of Moses to the very letter, he's saying to them this. Jesus is not a teacher adding to or subtracting from the Old Testament law of Moses. No, rather Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament law. And the whole Old Testament Mosaic law needs to be viewed through the lens of Jesus. And this law that these Pharisees follow so religiously needs to give way to Jesus Christ. Amen? The author of Hebrews says in chapter 7 and 8 that Jesus is the substance to which the shadows of the law point. Jesus is the substance to which the shadows of the law point. It's all about Jesus. Jesus comes to fulfill the law. Jesus comes to offer the entire world something much, much greater. He came to usher in a new covenant, a new creation, a new kingdom with freedom, liberation, healing, joy, and new wine. And in order to receive Jesus, this new wine You need to be completely new and transformed, just as Levi was. We need to be completely new and transformed to receive Jesus, just as Levi was. Jesus then warns us in verse 39, he says this. He says, and no one after drinking old wine wants new, because he says the old is better. Some, like the Pharisees, are too set in their old ways, too obsessed with self-righteousness and the law, and cannot get past the grace of this Jesus who eats and dines with sinners. Some cannot get past the grace of this Jesus who eats and dines with sinners. Now, I'm seeing a bit of confusion. All the wine connoisseurs in the room are looking a bit confused. Hmm? Yeah. And so for a moment, I need, to take, I need you to take off your wine connoisseur hat, right? Because if you enjoy wine, you'd know that, or at the very least, you'd have heard that old wine is better than new wine. Okay, but not in Jesus' day. The fermentation process, the corkage hadn't developed what we have today. And so here the old wine is not as good as the new wine. In this parable, Jesus is clearly saying that the new wine is actually better. And yet these Pharisees have no interest in Jesus and this new wine. They are sold out to the old wine. They are convinced it is the only wine. 
They don't even want to try this new wine. And so what Jesus is saying here is that there will be some who reject him. There will be some who prefer their religious life of salvation by works, a faith that looks impressive to outsiders, but one that is dead on the inside and devoid of joy. But family, there'll be others like Levi who trade the table of the tax booth for the table with Jesus, who receive new life, new wine, forgiveness, and freedom, who open up their house to sinners to share the good news, who give up their entire old lives, their entire old life in the service of their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, family, this, this Levi who ate with Jesus and who used the table of influence to share the good news with others had another name. His name was Matthew. And as a tax collector, he was a gifted record keeper. And he was good at extending the Roman Empire. But he met Jesus one day on the Sea of Galilee. And had his entire life turned upside down. Jesus used him and his gift of keeping records to write the gospel according to Matthew. The very first book in our New Testament. And he used him to take the good news to the Ani, the poor. And to make disciples of all nations. Extending the kingdom of God. Amen? And so as I call the band up and as we begin to land the plane, what can we learn from eating with Jesus? What can we learn from eating with Jesus. As Pastor One always says, the gospel demands a response. And so family, what is yours? What's your response this morning? Well, if you're not a Christian, brother and sister, look to Levi. Recognize your poverty of spirit. Your need for Jesus. Your need for a new identity, for forgiveness, for healing, for restoration. Say yes to this new wine. And let Jesus' Holy Spirit come and transform you and welcome you into his eternal kingdom. If that's you this morning, if you haven't put your faith and trust in Jesus yet, I encourage you to come spend some time at the prayer corner. Tell someone. Pray with someone. Look to Levi. Recognize your spiritual poverty and your need for Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And if you're a believer... What is our response? Gospel demands a response. Well, we too can learn from the fruit of Levi's faith. Are we open to seeing the poor in spirit? Are we open to seeing the poor in spirit? Or is our ministry focused solely on the physical poor? And fam, of course we need to do both. We need to minister to the physically poor, but we also need to minister to the spiritually poor, who may be very, very wealthy. Are we reaching out to those in positions of power and authority over us? Those who have influence over us? Or have we written them off as our enemy? Not worth it. They're disobedient sinners. Not our problem. Let's rather focus on those who need us in some way or who we can give something to. Family, brothers and sisters, do we see those who have made certain decisions taking that job, doing this, doing that, do we view them in a poor way, having poor social status? As, do we view them as part of our mission field? We're going to talk more about them next week. What about Levi's devotion? The fruit of his faithfulness. Immediately he got up. Immediately he got up and followed Jesus. He decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Following Jesus changed everything for Levi. And so it should for us. Brothers and sisters, what areas of our lives have we perhaps not yet surrendered to Jesus as Levi did? What areas are you looking for Jesus to come and cultivate fruitfulness in? A couple of weeks ago, Pastor One challenged us to write those areas on a card. Hashtag fruitfulness. And place them at the prayer corner. And I encourage you to do that today and to do that throughout this Eating with Jesus series. What areas are you wanting to surrender your life and see fruit, the fruit of Jesus Christ in your life? 
Then family, what we can else can we learn from Levi? Are we inviting our old friends to meet with Jesus? Are we inviting everybody we know to meet with Jesus? Are we talking to them about Jesus? Or are we compartmentalizing? Here's our church friends, here's our work friends, here's our school friends. These are folks I can talk to Jesus about. These folks, ooh, no, I don't think they know I'm a Christian. Am I opening up my home to further the gospel? Look at Levi, Levi opened up his home to further the gospel. Are you signing up to eat and run to become a host? If you have resources, are we using them for the good of the gospel to draw others closer to Jesus? Are we inviting and eating with them just as Jesus did? Last week, we had the saved cards, a hashtag one more, our one mores. And we put names of people that we're praying for. We wrote it out on the paper, said a prayer, put it in the pool, And we're looking forward to the day that we're gonna praise Jesus for what he does in those people's lives, amen? But I wanna challenge us today as we look to the life of Levi. These people may be close loved ones, people that we don't see as ani. Are we looking to the ani in our lives? Maybe it's time to write their names on this piece of paper and to put it in the pool. Pastor Ono mentioned that we are bringing back eaten runs, lochotlas. Times that offer us as a church the opportunity to eat and table with the Levi's in our lives. And we want our family groups and family expansion groups to be spaces where the Levi's, the tax collectors and the sinners are invited to come and eat with Jesus. Are we inviting the Levi's into our lives and into these spaces? And then finally, Christian leader. (sighs) Have we become so fixated on our idea of who Jesus is that we knock down anyone and everyone that doesn't fit into that mold? Are we separating ourselves from fellow believers because of their association with other people or certain views that aren't even sinful, but they're just different to us? Are we causing division within the church? May we repent for that. Family, the dinner invitations to the grand banquet have been sent. They're in your inbox. It's an open invitation and you're encouraged to bring your friends, family, and enemies as your plus one. You're invited. And so may we be obedient to that call, just as Levi was. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's pray. Oh, holy God, we are in awe of you. We are in awe of the fact that you sent Jesus to set the poor free to bring good news to the poor, to transform our lives, Lord God. We recognize that we are all poor, but for you, Jesus. But Lord Jesus, in you, we have found our Lord and Savior. In you, we find healing, restoration, forgiveness, wholeness, communion, intimacy, love, joy, peace, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And so, Lord God, as we come to you, as we come to your table today, as we draw near to you, Lord God, Would you grow our faith and trust? Lord God, as we think back on the people that invited us to this table, in the power of your Holy Spirit, may we be like Levi, like Matthew. May we go out into this world, into this week, to share your good news and your gospel with others, with the poor in spirit, with all those who need you, Lord God. Lord, I pray that you would grow our trust. Spirit, lead us to where our faith is without borders. Lead us to those places where the Ani are, Lord God. May we be our church on fire and on mission for your glory. For your honor, for your praise. Thank you for the privilege it is to eat at your table. Thank you that you meet us where we are. And so meet with us here this morning. Meet with us right now. For those of us who are non-Christians yet, Lord God, I pray that you would come and meet with us. Draw us to you. May we be safe in you. Lord Jesus, for those of us who have been following you for a long time, Lord God, may we surrender every area of our lives to you. And Lord God, for those of us who are leaders, have influence, have resources, may we use those all for your glory, to bring glory and honor to your name, Lord God, to bring health and goodness and unity to your church. We pray this all in Jesus' mighty and holy name. Amen.